really good to be here today. I spent quite a bit of time here earlier this year and it's lovely to have an excuse to come back again. I've sent the day that I put my coat in the lovely lockers and flashed my card and stuff whenever I come in, so it's really nice to be back here. The staff are all very good to me whenever I was working in the building. Um, I thought I would tell you a little bit about what detailed data is. Some of you may know who we are, what we are, um, a lot of you may not. Um, it's a partnership project between the investigative news website The Detail, which is where I work, and NICFA, and it represents the community and voluntary sector in Northern Ireland. It's a three-year project, and we have funding from Big Lottery Northern Ireland and Atlantic Philanthropies. And the aim of our project is to increase the frequency, quality, and type of government, government data open for public use, um, stronger and more effective advocacy and campaigning in, in that sector, and to encourage the organisations to use data to more accurately tell the stories of the people, families and communities they represent, and also to have better service planning in the sector. Um, the journalism projects would be the work that I do, and uh, as part of Detailed Data, we have to do at least 30 data journalism projects over three years. So working with NICFA, we talk to the community and voluntary groups to identify issues that we want to address and examine. And then we obtain data, and that's quite often statistics and figures, um, through freedom of information requests, sometimes it's the group's own data, or we have open data, or we create our own data sets from collecting material. And then we bring these findings to experts, and our storytelling would include sort of tra traditional written interviews, video content, interactive charts, maps, infographics, photography. We like to be quite creative in how we, we tell our stories. And we make all of the data publicly available um, through a data portal. So people can go in there and then look at the figures, maybe look at the ones relevant to their area, their local school, their local hospital, and they can kind of have their own reading of the story and their own reading of the statistics. Stories so far have been very varied. Um, some of the ones up there are asylum seeker figures. Um, we did one on domestic abuse. We did a piece on multiple sclerosis, living with HIV, um, holiday hunger, so that was about um, children on free school meals, um, not having free meals in the summer, breastfeeding, invest in eye funding, um, abortion up at the top, family courts up at the, the top right there. So we have a whole range of topics. And if you're interested in some of the work that we do, you can go onto our website and have a look at any of the stories that we've done today. Infographics would be key to what we do. So like I said, we tell the stories in a variety of different ways. Infographics can be a very powerful way of getting some key statistics across. These would travel very well on social media, you know, Twitter, Facebook, things like that, or they can be used by posters sometimes in organisations. Um, they've been used in government reports. Um, so infographics would be another thing that we use in our storytelling. In terms of stories that we've done to date, I think we're up to 25 out of the 30. Um, I just thought I'd mention some of the key findings from some of the projects that we've done. Uh, the domestic abuse project, it showed that 67 people were killed by a partner, ex-partner or a family member over 10 years here. And that, I find surprising, was 27% of the total homicides recorded by the police during the decade. In October 2015, there were 500 people at that time from countries across the world seeking asylum in Northern Ireland. And my colleague Lindsay did a lovely map to show where they were all coming from. We did one on road deaths, um, and it showed the number of people killed and seriously injured on roads, and that Fermanagh was the area that really stood out. My colleague um, Cormac looked at uh, paramilitary activity, and that showed from 2006 to 2015, paramilitaries were responsible for 22 killings, over 1,000 shootings and bombings, and 787 punishment attacks. And then suicide was another one that I did, and it um, showed that um, 7,697 people have died from suicide since 1970, and 318 took their own lives in 2015, and that was the highest on record, unfortunately. Um, just another some to mention here, um, only 42,000 of Northern Ireland's 220,000 carers actually received carers' allowance. Um, women from Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland had almost 25,000 abortions in England and Wales over a five-year period and that equates to an average of almost 100 every week. 934 people living with HIV in Northern Ireland. Again, that was a record year, unfortunately, too. And community transport is providing 216,000 trips a year to vulnerable people in society with no access to transport. And then my colleague Lindsay did a piece on breastfeeding, and that showed that more than 42,000 babies left Northern Ireland's hospitals over four years without breastfeeding being attempted, and that was just under half of all newborns. 
The impact of our stories is really varied. Um, our findings are featured in debate and discussion at the Northern Ireland Assembly. We would get written questions put in, we would get discussions at um, committees and things at the Assembly. Um, one really powerful thing is that community coalitions have been established to lobby and influence government collectively. That's happened specifically for the Carers Project and for Family Courts. So community and voluntary, voluntary sector groups working in those areas come together, meet together, plan together, lobby together, and it's much more powerful than doing it on their own. Coverage by other media, that's within Northern Ireland, outside of Northern Ireland, um, broadcast, um, print, online, radio. There have been funding announcements and policy changes after our stories. We can't claim it solely as a result of the work that we've done, but we like to think we've highlighted things that then um, the government <coughs> comes under pressure to react to and to maybe make some changes. A couple of our projects have involved um, really strong photography. The HIV project and the domestic abuse one were two that I did. And that photography is then gifted to the charity and they can use that in displays or use it in their buildings, um, but they can use the photography afterwards and journalism awards as well. Another thing I just don't have up there, I guess, is the, the impact it has on the individual groups, where maybe people within their groups are empowered to speak out publicly about an issue that's really important to them. So confidence building within the, the groups can be um, really important too, and can have an impact further down the line for those groups that's, that's important to them. So then I'm gonna talk more specifically about the Mother and Baby Home Project, and that was just the main image that we used um, with the piece whenever we published it. So for this project, we worked in partnership with Amnesty International. Um, key to it was examining archive material at Peroni. Um, we interviewed members of Birth Mothers and Their Children for Justice in um, Northern Ireland, and that brought the data and the paperwork to life with personal stories. And then once we had all our findings, and uh, we then sought comment from churches, the executive, adoption agencies, and others, and put all this together into one big piece. Our research at Promi, um, first port of call, as I think it is for most people, is searching the e-catalogue. So I was able to do that outside of this building, um, do a bit of research, looking for keywords, looking for things that um, I might want to come in and look at physically in terms of the paperwork. That was great, a bit of a learning experience for me. I hadn't really done proper um, searching in here before, so you go from looking for keywords like unmarried mothers or mother and baby homes to try and look for things a bit more obscure or just looking under children or looking under certain time periods. And you can go off in lots of different directions. Um, but I looked at the e-catalogue, decided what I wanted to, to look at, spoke to David, I think, before I even came into the building and got a bit of advice about maybe other things that I could look at. And then I had the reference numbers of what I wanted to look at and could come in for a really good solid period of days to then sit down with the paperwork and examine it. But the rest of that I could do from my office, which was great. So the archive material I looked at included inspection files on, on homes, a minute book, correspondence with government departments. And I also, <coughs> a really important part of uh, the project was looking at burial records for Milltown Cemetery. They run microfilm upstairs. Um, so I looked at those as well. I'll talk a bit more about that later on. So I had advice from David and other staff. I was saying to David, the staff in here were brilliant. From whenever you come through the door to whenever you're up in, in the room upstairs looking for a pencil or asking advice on how to work the microfilm, which I haven't used in probably decades. Um, they were all very, very good and very helpful. And a lovely, quiet space to work in. Um, had to ask for advice about things like taking photographs, which you're now allowed to do, which was brilliant for me because I was looking at such a high volume of material. I didn't want to spend an awful lot of money photocopying things. I didn't know if I would actually use it in the end, but I had everything. My phone was covered in sort of documents for a long time. Ownership of the material came up. I'll talk about that a bit further as well. Um, using the reference numbers and being aware, as David spoke about earlier, the different um, groups of files that you can get. So I might get one file and then realize that actually there's a series of files under the same heading that I can look at something more. Um, importantly, we started out looking at mother and baby homes, but it led me down the path of looking at children's homes more generally um, and the treatment of children um, who were considered illegitimate, and I put that in big inverted commas um, at that time. So reference numbers for the main items I use. This is in our stuff online if anybody's interested in looking further, and I think David has a lot of them here as well. So you can see there, there was a, you know, a file on one of the hostels. Um, there was a, an inspection file on one of the children's homes. There was a beautiful minute book for um, Malone Place, and it was a, a mother and baby home. That's the big, thick black book you can see up there. Um, Department of Health and Social Services file, Prime Minister's file, and that was correspondence between them and Salvation Army. 
And then there was the microfilm, which was um, the burial records. So what did the files tell us? There was so much that they told us. I only have some of it in here. Um, some of the key things were that they told us that pregnant girls as young as 13 years old were sent into mother and baby homes here. Official records from 1942 show that the legitimate infant mortality rate for Northern Ireland was 72 per 1,000 births, and it was 157 for illegitimate children, which is huge. Um, the minute book for Belfast Midnight Mission documented births, baby deaths, stillbirths, adoptions, and babies sent on to children's homes from 1934 to 1949. I absolutely lost myself in that book for a while. It was amazing. Um, the research confirmed the central role of the state in appeals for additional funding, official involvement in women and girls being sent to homes, inspection reports, and the maintenance of records of child deaths. Um, the chairman of one home for unmarried mothers, that was Hope Dean, hostel, warned the government in a 1945 letter that the infant mortality figures among illegitimate children are alarming, leading one to the conclusion that many of these unwanted children are allowed to die. That was actually the first letter that I saw on a file. Um, the Church of Ireland, which was connected to that home, contacted me after the article went out, and they are just keen for me to stress that, that they have no concerns about that home itself, and they feel that the letter was referring to the wider issue um, outside the home and children who weren't being cared for in homes like Hopeding. But that letter was so strong, and that was 1945, a warning was issued, and here we are in 2017. Um, video interviews. Uh, Michelle, Yunan and Una were brilliant. Um, they were willing to tell their stories about their experiences with, with mother and baby homes. And you can just see some of the quotes that are up there. Um, they humanised the paperwork. They also showed that the impact of the homes isn't just something in our past. It's something that's still impacting on families and people today. And that's the same with this documentation. Yes, it's historical, but it's still important for today and for people to take note of it today. So their interviews were really important. So I just wanted to show you Una's interview. All three are worth watching. Um, Una actually stayed in one of the homes, so hers is just particularly poignant. And 
to that way. Because every day that it went by after that, I used to wonder, was that him? Was that him? And it's just in silence, you know? I was saying to myself, will I tell him what was actually going on in my head? That was very hard to try and you never forget your first child. I went into that room as a Zulu and I came out as a different person. he was adopted and then discovered the connection with mother and baby home. He since made contact with his mom and, and speaks to her regularly. Um, the burial records. So the burial records um, were Milltown's um, public ground. They, they were available in microfilm, very difficult to read in some parts. Partly that was due to handwriting in some cases. I just willed the staff to change as I was reading through it and then it would become someone with decent handwriting. Or it was just the quality of, you could see that the way it reproduced, it was very light um, and it was very hard to read. So I had a good look through the whole thing. My aim was originally to look for deaths connected to mother and baby homes. I decided to pick one year to examine in detail. The main reason I picked 1942 was I could read it. I could read it and I could read it very clearly over the whole year, so that was the main reason why I picked that one year. I would like to have picked the most, one of the more recent ones, um, but I picked 1942. So I went through, um, the information included the, the date of interment, the grave number, the name of the deceased, their age, their residence. I inputted the full year of data into a spreadsheet, 
But then I looked for things that were jumping out at me and actually it wasn't mother and baby homes for that year, although I could see it showing up in other years. For me it was two children's homes that for that year were very, very prominent. Um, so I combined these records with the death certificate information and that's the death certificate you can see up at the top there. Um, and I was able to, so there were 63 children across these two children's homes that died in 1942 that were buried in Milltown's public grounds. So they're the, the mass um, graves that don't have the headstones on them. Um, and then with the death certificate I was able to find the cause of death for 56 of the children. Um, that took a lot of time to try and find the, the death certificates for each of those cases. Infographic on the left, obviously not very clear to see here, but you can look at that on our website. That gives information on those 63 cases. So on the left-hand side of the infographic, it's the information that we got from the burial records. And on the right-hand side for each child, it's the information that we got from the death certificate. So this showed that 63 children, 21 girls and 42 boys from Nazareth House and Nazareth Lodge children's homes were buried in unmarked mass graves in Milltown in 1942. These homes were also mentioned in some of this paperwork in terms of these were among the homes that some of the children moved on to after they were in the mother and baby homes. These children, when they died, were aged between two weeks and almost two years old. And of the 56 children I was able to get death certificates for, 77%, which is 43 of them, died from malnutrition. Um, again, I just mentioned the mortality rate, which I talked about before, and that was taken from a Registrar General report um, in Ireland. And then just to mention some of the individual cases, one of the babies was six week, six week old George, who died from severe malnutrition on a septic scalp in October 1942. Marie died um, aged two months in January 1942 from cardiac failure due to marasmus, and it seems to be her twin sister Jean, who died two weeks later, and they were buried in separate mass graves. Um, the reason I know they were twins, the mother's name was the same, their home address was the same, surname was the same. So. You would love to be able to ask people some of these questions, but my assumption is that they were twin sisters. Um, we went to the Catholic Church to ask for their response to a lot of the stuff, but in particular the deaths of these children. And actually the Catholic Church press office, which, in, which is in Dublin, their response was really pathetic. They referred me to four old press releases. Um, I think three of them were from four years ago, and none of them referred to Northern Ireland, so they didn't really comment on it at all. But the Down and Connor Diocese got far more involved. Um, I had quite a bit of discussion with them and they gave me a very detailed response, mainly to the deaths of the children, but also to some of the, the wider findings. Um, Sisters of Nazareth, Nazareth who ran the homes, um, they said the information was very concerning and sad and all children should be loved unconditionally and treated with equality and dignity. Importantly, they said that if there was an investigation or a wider inquiry into mother and baby homes, they would fully cooperate with that. And then you can see the response there from the Down and Connor Diocese saying that the findings add further to their shame and show that how as a church and society we fail to protect the most vulnerable members of our community. They do say lack of resources, um, restricted financial support, historical context, all those kind of things play into it, but no simple explanation can be provided and nor should we look to explain away the deaths of these children. There is more in the article in terms of responses to the deaths of those children. Issues with the Peroni records, um, closed files, I really wanted to sneak in here some night and just kind of look at the stuff I couldn't see. Um, so the, the book on Malone Place was their minute book, but there was also an admissions book on Malone Place, but it would have too much personal information for me to be allowed to see it. But that would probably tell you who's coming in, when they're going out, what happens to their baby. More detailed information on that, I would love to be able to see that. But also even... More frustratingly, there are still files retained by the religious orders and by others, and I've heard some of that as I've gone along. Um, I know there's one of the homes that has index cards for every child that went through the mother and baby home, um, and that has information on it about who the mother was, sometimes who the father was, what happened to the child, what happened to the mother. Little colourful things like they found their trouble in Dublin. Um, things on these cards that, again, I would love to be able to see and to be able to report on, not to put the individual's information out there, but to look for patterns. Where did these babies go? What happened to them? What happened to the mothers? What ages were they? Um, but that's another thing that I can't see. There were really major contradictions between the burial records and the children's death certificates. Um, so you would have a name on the burial record and a date that they were buried. But then to find the death certificate, you had to know when they died. Um, you had their name, but they might go under their first name or their middle name. Their surname could be spelled differently. 
Um, their gender could change. One was Patrick, one was Patricia, but it was pretty clear it was the same child. I had to make judgment calls as I went along, and that infographic that you saw there with all the babies' names, I'm very open about the different things that were an issue as I went through. In some cases, they're just, you can see I could only find 56 of the death certificates. The other ones I couldn't find a death certificate for. I was told at one point that children who didn't have a birth certificate could not get a death certificate, so it could be they never had a birth certificate, they couldn't get a death certificate. It could be somebody didn't register their death, it could be there could be something more suspicious going on, but there were lots of contradictions. Um, in a number of cases, it seems like they died on a date after they were buried, which obviously isn't physically possible, you presume that's an error, but it happened enough times to think, is this just that people were very casual about these deaths, nobody really registered them properly. There may have been um, people who had problems with reading and writing, did they just not write their child's name down properly? Or did people just not care about these children? So there were really serious differences that I would love to project on that, but um, there were contradictions that I had to make judgment calls as I went, is this the same child? Um, do I, and I noted down where, say, the death was uh, registered as being after the burial. One time it was 10 days after that supposedly they died, even though they'd been buried 10 days before. Um, another issue was the ownership of the burial records. So they are here in Peroni, but they're owned by the Down and Conrad Diocese. So I had to contact them about using the records for permission to use them, for permission to use images from them. Um, and then the issue came up about naming the children. So. I know the first and second name of the vast majority of the children. One, they didn't put their surname in, they just had them as their first name. But um, Down and Connor Diocese allowed me to publish the information, but they didn't want me to use the surname of the children because they thought it may identify living relatives or siblings or family members that are still around now. So we had a long debate about that. I personally felt that these babies were denied their names in death. They had no gravestones. They, um, in some cases, the records were all messed up. I felt quite strongly that I, I wanted to name the children and give them an identity. Um, but we sought legal advice um, and we came to the conclusion that actually we wouldn't run the surnames. And actually I don't think the story is any weaker, you still get the emotion, you still get the children's um, identities in some way, but I would love to have been able to use the surnames, but we couldn't do the piece. Now we did have some calls from people afterwards who were saying, is that my brother? Can you check something? Can you, you know, and you would like to be able to put the names out there so that people who maybe don't feel they can ring and contact me can at least have the information in front of them. There were other data protection concerns throughout the records. Um, you probably saw in the uh, death certificate that we blanked out parents' names for the same reasons that you don't want to identify um, living relatives. Um, in the files, most of them were redacted before they reached me in terms of any names that I shouldn't use, but it's something we had to be aware of the whole way through. We didn't want to give people's addresses either. The use of images, it was brilliant to be able to take photographs in here and then I could decide afterwards what images I used to illustrate because I think for people who aren't in here looking at the records, they want to see visually what I have looked up. Then deciding when to stop researching. Anybody who's been in here will know this one. You have to decide when to stop because you can just keep going and keep going. Um, and I would love to have kept going and I'm looking over there at some things I haven't seen and I'm kind of itching to go back and look at them. But you have to decide when to stop and which, you know, you could go down lots of different alleyways and lots of different directions. So you have to decide this is enough and we work with what we have. So all of the articles were published um, on June 14th and they were published on our website. You can see that there were about, I think about seven different pieces that we ran. Um, two of them specifically connected to the Prony records, one on the babies and one on those files. And then we the interviews um, with the, the three people up there and then we read other stuff as well. So you can have a look at that if you want to on our website. That same day, um, Amnesty International and the Birth Mothers Group held a press conference in Belfast. <coughs> and you can see there it was attended by a, a lot of other media. And this resulted in radio, TV, online, social media coverage. And that's just some of it there. There was an awful lot more. Um, it was on BBC and UTV News that night and appeared in lots of different papers and online and outside of Northern Ireland and further afield. <coughs> what next? Um, other victims and survivors of the mother and baby homes have contacted the birth mothers group um, to support their ongoing campaign for a public inquiry. The Department of Health fairly recently um, put out a tender for further research into the homes and the aim is for an interdepartmental group to make recommendations on the way forward for, Northern Ireland, for the Northern Ireland Executive on the nature of any potential review or inquiry. And then, very importantly, on September the 4th, Belfast City Council unanimously supported the call for an inquiry. 
um, and just uh, Birth Mothers and Their Children for Justice and Amnesty International continuing their campaign. They're still working on that in the background as well. And that's it. So if you want to read stories, you can have a look there. And then if anybody has any questions.